Let's read out of Exodus. Now I do, I'm going to go ahead and give honor where honor is due. I got on the phone the other day, old Matt Darden called me up. Some of y'all know who Matt is, some of you don't. But he's just this guy I used to go to church with that called me up one day. He goes, hey man, I've been watching your YouTube videos. Would you take a look at this message that I'm about to preach to the youth group over here? I'm like, yeah, send it to me, man. I'll take a look. His first message he ever preached, I was like, oh my gosh. Dude, if it comes out half as good as this boy wrote this thing. And I was like, I was just blown away, man. The message of the cry, man, you know, look. And anyway, since that time, we've had multiple conversations. And I'm telling you, man, he has just grown so fast. <laughs> I've gotten him to preach over here about three or four times. He, he still goes to the other church. And, you know, and it's okay, brother. We forgive you. Uh, he, he, you know, but I tell you what, that's probably really where the Lord wants him right now. Amen. Uh, everywhere all got seasons and God's using him over there. So praise God for that. But he... But in this conversation, I'm going to have to start answering the phone more often when he calls. In this conversation, well, he made a comment about this particular episode that took place in, in this story having to do with Moses. And to be honest, he's like, dude, I'm going to use that. He said, he said, yeah, well, go ahead, man. Go ahead and use it. You know, most preachers won't give credit. Where credit like, I'm giving the brother credit. I'm giving you the intro credit, at least on a thought in this message. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So to be seated. Amen. All right. So everybody take a seat. Y'all ready? We're going to read Exodus chapter 17. We're going to read verses 8 through 16. It says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose out men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. So as long as Moses held up the rod of God in his hand. And you know, the rod always spoke of authority. It spoke of really the hand of God. He allowed Moses to wield his power. He used that rod to part the Red Sea as he pointed it out that way. That rod also turned into a serpent just like those magicians in Egypt did. And it gobbled up their <coughs> serpent. And so that rod represents the power of God moving and operating on behalf of his people. It's in Moses' hand. He's holding it up and victory is prevailing. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. So we see a struggle that's ensuing between the people of God and the works of the powers of darkness, if you will. And there's times that, that, that this struggle, that there's ebbs and flows in this struggle. Does that remind you of any uh, aspects of your life, maybe, where sometimes you feel a little bit stronger, amen, feeling a little bit spiritually stronger, doing well, and then all of a sudden there's this, there's this downturn, and you start to feel like you're getting pushed back a little bit, and you don't really understand. Listen to me. You're in the midst of a spiritual battle. There is a war that's taking place in the heavenlies, and the devil's not going to quit. He's going to try to make you quit. I'm telling you, with all of the all of the force and the power that he has, he wants to make you quit. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but he wants to blind your eyes. He wants to prevent you from being able to see the truth that is in Christ, the truth that is in the Word of God, that will empower you, that will give you access, hallelujah, to the to the to the wind that, that allows the eagle with his wings to soar, to be lifted up, hallelujah, above where the, above where the frustration lies. Listen, I'm not saying that the frustration quits. Right. I'm not telling you tomorrow when you get up and you go to work Amen. that it's not going to still rain. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so tired of rain. <laughs> <laughs> dude, I've been thinking about you, Robert, now, dude. Now that it rains, I mean, my, one of my best friends, man, it's like now when I put, I'm like, not only do I hate this rain, but ooh, I bet you Robert hates this rain. <laughs> I'm so frustrated with rain. I don't mean to get off on a rabbit trail, but dude, the thing, I, went to, I went to Destin in August and it's just, the sun shined the whole time. And as soon as I drove back to life, to Morgan City, it ain't stopped raining since. I'm so sick of rain. Anyway, rain is frustrating. Me. All kind of frustration. But you know what? The presence of the Lord, that's a simple thing because I got a whole lot more battles going on in my life than rain, to be truthful. 
you know, but but but, fr but frustrations will try to come. It's not that the frustrations are going to stop. It doesn't mean the rain's going to stop tomorrow. It doesn't mean that you that you that, that some family member isn't going to still talk and trash behind your back. That an old friend of yours isn't going to be saying things. Oh yeah, well he said whatever. Look at him, whatever. He's all religious, but look what. Okay, and it doesn't mean that none of that all that stuff's going to stop. But let me tell you something. The presence of God entering into a situation when the grace of God shows up, when you begin to allow to to really get a revelation of allowing the Lord to be your defender. Listen to me. It's one thing to say. Come on, somebody. Have you ever just felt like you had to take up for yourself? That you had to defend? Oh, no. They didn't do that to me, did they? Did they just insult me? Did they just say that thing to me? Oh, did they really put that on Facebook? Did they just go there? Oh, yeah, they did. Now, what are you going to do, Christian? Are you going to be like the rest of the world, like the rest of the Facebook amen, community? Amen. It's, you know, are you going to are you going to retaliate? Or are you, are you going to learn how to really allow the Lord to be your defender? Amen. 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 Yes, There's a place that requires rest in order to go there. Listen to me. I don't even think I can articulate it properly with words. There's a spiritual thing. I don't even know why I'm here. You, somebody in here is dealing with it. I don't, even, I, I don't even know if I can articulate it with words. I know a lot of words, but I don't think I can get it out properly to describe to you the spiritual struggle Hallelujah. that takes place when you've been, uh, whenever conflict has entered your life, when you feel like you've been wronged, when you feel like somebody has done something to you, and the desire that rises up on the inside of you in order to get back yeah. in your own strength, to rectify yourself, to take your own defense, to say, I be like you in a courtroom and I, I will be I will be my own defense attorney your honor I will be handling my own case today and I am going to lay out the cause of why I'm right and why this person's wrong you understand what I'm trying right. to say and, 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 and you don't get anywhere with it you keep trying to fix it why am I here I don't know but just didn't bear with me you keep trying to fix it you keep trying to make your point, and at some point in time, if somebody really loved you was around, they'd say, who cares? Amen. Who really cares? You keep on trying to fix this situation. You're trying to convince everybody, and guess what? You're probably right. You were probably wronged in the midst of this situation, but can I tell you? You're spending so much energy on it, you're not getting anywhere. You're just creating more turmoil, more frustration in the midst of your life, and what the Lord's wanting you to do is to learn how to rest and allow Him to truly be your defender. Not to just say, oh, the Lord's my defender. I can remember sitting in a car one time, this woman that was worked with me, and she had those frustrations going on. I was trying to minister to her, and she was saying this, that she's like, the Lord's my defender, and I finally stopped, and I said, okay, sister, I believe that. And I mean, look, Lord knows that I've said that many a times and haven't really allowed him to be the defender, but you ain't letting God be your defender right now. You, you got a real good positive confession coming out your mouth, but, but really and truly what you're saying is you're going to get your vengeance. But the word of God says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Listen to me. When you humble yourself, when you humble yourself in the midst of a circumstance, when the, when the Lord says, you know, and I'm kind of shooting from the hip here, but vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And then there's another place where he talks about, you know, walking in humility and I will heap fires of coal upon their head. You know, the right, the right attitude is not like, oh, yeah, I'm going to let the Lord get him. I'm going to let the Lord get him because he said in his word, he's going to heap fires of coal on their head. And I can't wait to see their hair. Singing. No, that's not God's will. God's will wants to get our hearts broken in his presence where our hearts Hearts are softened and we begin to realize that this person, whoever this situation is that's coming against us, that, that, that is treating us the way that they are, that they are lost. Listen to me. They're lost. And if they don't allow their heart to be, I don't care if they're a Christian. If they're walking around full of bitterness trying to make your life miserable, they are wrong and they are outside of the will of God. And if they continue down that course, they're going to get harder. They're going to get more bitter. But guess what? You can humble yourself. Amen. 
You can humble yourself and you can release yourself. Somebody, somebody in here today, maybe a bunch of people in here today, you've experienced what I'm talking about. People have come against you. People have said things and it has caused frustration in your spirit, man. And I'm here to tell you that if you will spiritually release that to the Lord and say, God, I can't handle it. I need to surrender. I'll put my hands up. I'm about to take a seat on this situation and let you take the lead in this because I want to be free in this. Listen, the Lord will liberate your heart. Almost like there was your heart was wrapped up with a whole bunch of chains and a lock and a bunch of padlocks. He just started unlocking them chains, start slowly unwinding those chains that, that bound your heart. And then all of a sudden your heart's beating stronger and stronger each and every day. And you're feeling lighter and lighter each and every day because the presence of the Lord, amen, lifted you up with wings of eagles. I'm telling you there's a freedom spiritually in Christ. Hallelujah. No matter what you're going through. I don't care what it is this morning. Pick it. I'm not, do I have to go through a whole list of things that can bring you in bondage? Do I really have to do that? I mean, I don't think I do because as soon as you talk about bondage or things that people struggle with, they know exactly in their own head and in their own heart what it is that they're struggling with. I'm here to tell you that the Lord can liberate us from each and every one of those things if we want him to, if we will allow him to. Sometimes it's those relationships. Sometimes it's past hurts. Sometimes it's physical things that we find ourselves continuously going back to. And we don't want to be that way because it separates us from the Lord. Listen to me. We have to sit down, have to raise our hands and surrender, have to hold on to the power of God and let God have the victory. And as long as Moses held his hands up, then, then guess what? Israel and Joshua on the battlefield are prevailing. But it goes on to say this. And when he let down his hands, Amalek prevailed. <laughs> but Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him. Can I can I also say this to you, God? I don't mean to go off. I'm going off a little too much on this. Maybe. You know that sometimes even in that situation that you might have thought of, that I said, whatever it is you're struggling with, or this person and the way they treated you, there are actually times in your walk with God where one day you will feel a release. And you will feel the freedom that I'm talking about. And you'll be like, man, I know what that preacher was talking about now. I can feel the presence of God working in this situation. This is beautiful. And then the next thing you know, one little thing happens and you're right back where you were. <coughs> Amalek prevailing again. Oh, why is this happening? Listen to me. Sooner or later, we got to start catching on to the wiles of Satan. What is wild? You ever watch Roadrunner when you were young? I know some of y'all are so young. I don't even know what Roadrunner is. Roadrunner's nemesis, Wile E. Coyote. Always has some kind of trap to set. Wiley. It's what it is. It's a trap. It's a scheme. It's trying to set you up. There's something set up around the corner. The enemy's always trying to set you up with a trap to mess you up, to trip you up, so that you'll go back into looking at your circumstance and situation instead of keep on looking at the one that can give you the victory. So Amalek would prevail when Moses would put his hand down. But Moses' hands were heavy, and, and this is what they did. They took a stone. And they put it under him. That was a big part right there. A big part of this victory was they took a stone and they put it under him. And he sat there on. Let me say that again. He sat on a rock. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you for the rock this morning, Lord. He sat there on and Aaron and her stayed up his hands. The one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited. There are a lot of different ways you could say that. Put a whooping on him. He won. He, he took the battle to them. He defeated them. He defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial. Now, there are so many good memorials in the Old Testament. You know, on Wednesday nights, we kind of get deep into the word of God. That's one of the things that I love about being a preacher, to be honest with you. There's some things that, I, I, if I'm honest, that... I don't really like as much about being a preacher, you know, but there's some things I love about being a preacher. Number one, it causes me, it drives me to continue to study the word of God. And I love the word of God. And as I study the word of God, I have to study it at another level. And when I study it at another level, it really starts to get synced into my heart. It starts to sink into my heart. And then whenever I bring it out, it's kind of like I really, I really remember things. And just that word memorial reminds me of a couple of circumstances that take place in the book of Exodus. And I know I talk to you about them a lot. But one of the things that, that one of the memorials that I'm remembering, two of them real quick, had to do with the Passover. 
I talk about the Passover a lot because it's a type of Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's a type of the lamb that was without blemish, that was sacrificed. Amen. And then that blood was taken and it was painted on the doorpost and the side post. And the result of that was that God said judgment is coming on the land. Egypt is a type of the world. Judgment was coming on the world. Listen to me. Judgment will come upon the world. It's, it's going to happen again. I got a little bit of it in this message today. It's going to happen again. And th that which happened in the past will be repeated again. Trust me, the word of God does not lie. It might look like he's taking a long time. The word of God says that he's not tearing because he's slack as some men count slackness. In other words, God's not lazy in what he's doing. No, the reason that he takes his time. So don't listen to your friends. And, well, oh, yeah, where's this God you're talking about? They've been writing about it. They've been saying it. He said in the end days there will be scoffers. They'll be saying, where is he? Where's his return? The Lord's not, not slack like man. No, he's long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's long-suffering. That's why he waits. He waits for people like you. He waits for people like me. One more day. One more hour. One more minute. Oh, hallelujah. If one of my servants would just get a hold of him and speak the word that I asked to be spoken, I'd move by my spirit and grab a hold of their hearts and they'd get an opportunity to grab a hold of me. That's why I wait. That's why I'm Terry. Hold on, Christian soldier. Hold on. But I strike the doorpost, and whenever judgment comes, I will pass yes. over you. Hallelujah. Have you taken the blood of the Lamb that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ and said, Yes, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I accept you as my sacrifice for my sin. Lord, if it weren't for you coming on the cross and taking your righteousness and offering it on the cross in place of my sinfulness, I would die in my sin. I would be like the Egyptians that were plagued that night, that their firstborn died, and I would be I would die. But Lord, I I accept your sacrifice. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Hallelujah. And the Lord said, write this down as a memorial. Passover. Do it every year. Every year in your wanderings and everywhere you go in your homes. Do the Passover every year. Why? To remember. To remember how I delivered you out of Egyptian bondage with a heavy hand. I am your God and I delivered you out. Don't forget what I've done for you. And the Lord would say to you this morning that whatever you were in. Yeah. Oh, but I'm not quite out yet, preacher. That's okay. You just keep holding on. But, oh, man, look, Aubrey, little Aubrey wrote a little picture the other day. Uh, that's Mike and Sharon's daughter. She had two people right there. And one, she said, one was Jesus. Jesus said, how are you, Aubrey? And, and, and the other one said, how are you, Jesus? And she had her hand. They were holding hands. I couldn't help myself. I can't really sing, but it made me think of that song. Put your hand in the hand of the man who steal the waters. Put your hand in the hand. Man, I don't really remember the other words to the song, but boy, I started getting the ball. Look, I was getting excited. Just put your hand in the hand of the man that tells the waters, be still. And they listen to him. Oh, there's a place of rest. It's a memorial. Don't forget where the Lord brought you from. I don't know where you've been, what you've been through, but don't forget where the Lord brought you from. Because he ain't bringing you back. If you're going back, it's not the Lord leading you there. You know, took, you know, took the hand out of his hand. That's good. Now, hey, hold your hand today, Lord. Come on, somebody. For me to act like that, you know I've done that before. <laughs> Lord, hold your hand today, Lord. I want to do, Matt's going to do his own thing today. I'm getting rowdy. Matt's going to do his own thing today. No, don't take your hand out the hand of the man that steals the waters. So that was a memorial. Paint the door post, side post, do it every year. Don't forget. Remember that other memorial? What was it? He says, he, it wasn't long after that. Had to do with the firstborn. He said, when the firstborn lamb comes out, you got to sacrifice it. He said, if a donkey comes out, the firstborn donkey, you got to break its neck. You either got to take one of your lambs and sacrifice it. I remember Robert said, man, that was so good when you said that. And I didn't even catch it. He called. It. He said it was so good, man. The clean had to die for the unclean. Because see, a donkey was an unclean animal. The lamb, come on, don't tell me that the Old Testament, it, it, it doesn't have, it, the Old Testament's full of the life of Jesus. The innocent one had to die in place of the guilty one. And if you needed a donkey because you needed more, a beast of burden to do more 
work in the field more than you needed a lamb right then, then it wasn't free. Instead of breaking the donkey's neck of the firstborn, you had to sacrifice a lamb in its place. So if you need a donkey, you're going to have it, but you're going to have to sacrifice a lamb. He said, hey, why are you getting us to do this, Lord? Because I want it to be a memorial. One day your kid's going to wake up and he's going to say, Daddy, why do we keep doing this? Why do we roast the lamb every year and eat it inside the house and eat these old bitter herbs? Why, son? Because it's a memorial. It reminds us of the fact that God delivered us out of Egypt with a powerful hand. Daddy, why we got to break that lid? Why we got to kill that little lamb? He's so furry and cute. Why we got to do that? Why we got to do that every time there's a firstborn? Why we got to break that donkey's neck? That's mean, Daddy. No, no, no. It's a memorial, son. See, that's not mean. No, 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 no. It's, it's kindness. See, that's what the world would have us to believe. Oh, look how mean of a God he is, the animal rights activist. Why would they kill these animals? Because they were types and shadows of what God would have to do. Let me tell you what's mean. Satan is mean. Sin is mean. Destruction and deception is mean. It causes people to go in the wrong direction. It deludes their mind. Whoa. Causes them to go down the wrong path. And in a state of deception, to be killed under the influence of sin. And to lose their eternal soul and their opportunity to have relationship with God. God, that's me. But God is kind, merciful, loving. And these animals represented the death of these animals who had nothing to do with the sin of Adam, who had nothing to do with the sin of Adam's fallen race, all represented and painted a picture that was coming of the Holy One, the Righteous One, that would come and he would die. And here it again, we see a memorial. He says... But Moses' hands were heavy, and they put a stone under him, and he sat there on, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, and the one on the one side, the other on the other side. His hands were steady till the going down of the sun, and Joshua discomfited. He said, write this as a memorial. He said, write it in a book and rehearse it in the years of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Oh, hallelujah. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but let me tell you something. There's coming a day when there will be a day. In human history. Oh man, I wish I could wish I could help you take a little walk to that day. It's kind of hard. You gotta spend a lot of time reading the Bible and put a bunch of pieces of a puzzle together. But let me just tell you, the Bible talks about a time and a frame when your body will no longer look the way that it looks. I can't tell you exactly what it's gonna look like, but you're gonna look like Jesus. You're not gonna have sin. You're not gonna be the one, but you're gonna be born of him. And you're gonna look oh so different. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that there's going to be a resurrection. Jesus already resurrected. He's the first fruits of the resurrection. He was the first one to go. But guess what? There's a whole bunch that's following. The rest of the harvest is coming, folks. And the rest of the harvest is whenever the church, hallelujah, leaves the earth that is in its fallen state because of sin. And this earth is going to be made anew. But not only that, your bodies are going to be made anew. The Bible talks about a glorified body that will be given to you. And it's going to be completely different than the one that you have now. And even still, don't, don't, even still, I believe it with all of my heart. It's kind of hard to talk about because I'm, I didn't plan on doing this. But there's going to be a time frame known as the millennial reign of Christ. I'm going to go ahead and talk about it. All right, just bear with me. A time frame known as the millennial reign of Christ. And in the millennial reign of Christ, it's going to be so different than the way that it is now. See, right now, there's a God of this world, the prince of the power of the earth. Jesus called him the prince. He, he's the God of this evil age that we're in. He's given power. I'm talking about Satan. He's given power to work through sin in man to bring destruction. We see it all around us. We see it in our own lives. Right now, the spirit that is prevalent in the atmosphere it is the spirit of Antichrist. It's not, it's not what's prevalent in this house right now. The Holy Spirit is prevalent in this house right now. The Holy Spirit wants to be prevalent in your life each and every day, each and every day that you walk. The Holy Spirit wants to be the prevalent spirit in your life. Good news, good news. The Holy Spirit can be the prevalent spirit in your life each and every day, every step you take. Why? Because you put your faith in the righteous one. He gave you his righteousness and now you have access to the grace of God and the spirit of God lives in you. He dwells in you. He will lead and guide you and he will go each and every day, every step that you take with you. Yes. But there's going to be a day in this millennial reign of Christ whenever there's going to be a flip-flop, a reversal of fortunes. 
See, that's what the word revelation means. Let me repeat this. Revelation. The word revelation talks about an unveiling. That which you couldn't see before, now you can see. I was talking about Revelation a couple of Wednesdays ago when I was talking about the Word. And what I meant by that was, in case some people don't understand, is that sometimes we read something and we kind of understand how to read the words on the page, but we don't understand what it is that we're reading. We need a revelation from the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to unveil our, the scales from our eyes so that we can see. That's what the word revelation means when we talk about the book of Revelation. It means the word is apocalypto, apocalypse, the unveiling. What is the book of Revelation going to unveil? It's going to unveil Jesus. He's going to be revealed. That which was spoken of for thousands of years of human history that said, hey, he's coming. He's not just the seed of the woman. He's not just the seed of Abraham. He's not just the seed of Judah or the seed of David. But he's the word that spoke the world into existence that came in human flesh who was without sin, who died on a cross. And he didn't die just for the couple in the garden. He didn't die just for the family in Exodus. He didn't die just for the nation of Israel on the day of atonement. No, John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin Hallelujah. of the world. Hallelujah. And there's going to be a reversal of fortunes because he's going to be unveiled. Listen to me. It might sound sci-fi to you, but I'm convinced Jesus is coming back on a white horse. And he's going to set up his throne on the throne of David. And he's going to rule. And he's going to reign. And there's not even going to be a need for a son. Hallelujah. Because the son and the father give the light thereof. And there's no longer going to be a spirit of heaviness on the land. Because slew foot that lying devil's going to be in a bottomless pit for a thousand years. Hence the word millennial reign of Christ. And I see it now. I see it. All the saints of old who had believed in the Lord on that day, who now have glorified bodies. This is the way I see it. Listen to me. Part of this is my commentary. I ain't going to lie to you. I'm going to tell you when it's partly my commentary. Because I can't prove it exactly. But it don't make no sense any other way. Here you are during the millennial reign of Christ. You've either, either died and you've gone up in the resurrection. You've received your glorified body because that's what it says in 1 Corinthians. It said the dead in Christ shall rise first. Yeah. Then we who are alive and remain will go to meet them in the air. And there we shall be with the Lord forevermore. Oh, yes. Receive the glorified body according to 1 Corinthians 15. You're not the same, man. I think it's going to be like Jesus. You just be able to walk through walls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your atoms are still there some kind of way. But, but you just walk right through solid things. <laughs> think something and there you are. I can't prove that, but that's what I believe is going to be. And here you are walking, and guess what? The Lord still has a plan for you because just as you were preaching on this earth, he said this. He's in the parable of the talents. This has nothing to do with my message, but you know what? I'm preaching my message this Hallelujah. morning. Hallelujah. I'm going to preach the whole thing. So you just sit back. Amen? <laughs> it, it, says, it says that in the parable of the talents, he gave one, one. He gave one, three. He gave one, five. He said, I'm going on a long journey, and when I come back, I expect you to give back what was mine. I expect to see a return on what I gave you. And one with five doubled. He said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have done well on this side. Come on, enter into your rest where you will be a ruler of many. He, the one with the three, he came back and he had doubled his. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You are faithful in what I gave you on this side. Come on, enter into your rest and I will make you a ruler of many. But the unfaithful servant, he wasn't given the same commendation. Listen to me. On this earth, I heard one preacher say it like this. This is a dress rehearsal for eternity. God's giving you and I an opportunity. You ever played sports before? Sometimes, you know, my daddy used to tell me when I played football, let me tell you something, boy, don't you sit on that bench. Don't you sit on that bench. You take a knee at the sideline and, or you follow that coach around and you irritate him and you bug him. And you keep telling him, coach, put me in the game. Coach, put me in the game. If he tells you to go sit on the bench, no, you go take a knee at the sideline and you get back up again and you go tell him, coach, put me in the game. Coach, put me in the game. You pastor him until he puts you in the game and then you better do something once you get in there, boy. And so the point to the whole story is this, is that God has allowed you and I to partake in the game, if you will. God has already defeated Satan. God, even, Satan was defeated before God ever even spoke him into existence. That's right. And Jesus has already defeated him in the physical, spiritual realm when he died on the cross. The power that you and I need in order to walk in victory has already been given to us based on faith. But he's allowing you and I to get off the pine, that's the word for the bench, and to get in the game. He's allowing you and I to partake with him as saints and soldiers in this war that's taking place. To live for Jesus. Hallelujah. 
and to tell people about the goodness Amen. of the Lord. And even in that day, in that millennial reign, when their reversal of fortune is taking place, because listen, they're going to let him loose for another thousand years. It don't make sense to let him loose unless there's some other people on earth that are kind of like the way we used to be. There's still a sinful nature in them, but the prevalent spirit in the atmosphere is not the sinful spirit of the Antichrist. Instead, it's the, it's the righteous spirit of God. The, the wolf and a, and a child are lying together. Lion and lambs lying together. Child can touch an, a snake and not be bitten and poisoned. I believe there won't even be tornadoes or hurricanes. Creation will no longer be groaning, waiting for the redemption of the yeah. sons of men because it will have taken place. Hallelujah. Mankind will have received his glorified body. Hallelujah. And everything will be peaceful and harmonious. But there's still a group of people that have to make a decision ultimately for Amen. Jesus. You made your decision. Amen. You got your glorified body. It's kind of like we'll be walking around. I don't even know why I'm talking about this. I just felt like I was supposed to. We'll be walking around and be like, man, you should have seen what it was like before. Mm -hmm. There was chaos on the earth. It was miserable. But man, it's so beautiful. We hadn't seen rain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, you don't even know. You should have remembered 2018 and 19. It was a mess. <laughs> but he's going to be loose for a short period of time. And he's going to deceive the nations. There's still going to be people that were raised in a different atmosphere where all they knew was the goodness of God. And they will still be deceived by the deceiver. I didn't plan anything that I just talked about, but much of my message talks about the deception of the liar. But I'm here to tell you that there will be a day when God will utterly destroy Amalek. He said that. He said, I will utterly destroy Amalek. There's going to be a day when God will utterly destroy Satan. It's going to be even after that millennial reign of Christ. Once he cleans all that up, he's going to take him. I got the scripture at the very end. He's going to throw him in a place called Gehenna, the lake of fire, where the eternal torment of his smoke, along with the beast and the antichrist and all those who had the mark of the beast upon them, will burn and be be tormented. Amen. You might not like this kind of preaching, but it's in the word of God. All those that threw in their lot with Satan will be in that place and they will have eternal torment. The smoke of their torment will rise forever and forever and forever. God will bring the final victory over Amalek. Hallelujah. Aren't you thankful yes. that you were at least given the opportunity to get on the right Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Robert, for telling me the truth. Amen. Thank you, my sister Debbie, for telling me the truth. Thank whoever it was that first told you the truth. Maybe it was somebody in jail. Thank you. Hey, when I was in jail and I didn't know what I was, didn't know what I was going to do that you told me the good news about Jesus yeah. Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? All right. You, you with me. So listen, this is my introduction. This is a story as another example reminding us of the age-old battle of God's people and a battle with their enemy, which emphasizes the importance of God's presence in the middle of the battle in order for victory to take place. Amen? That was just reading the story. Now this is the introduction. A battle. A battle is taking place. But it reminds us in this battle, we need God's presence in the midst of the battle. We can't do it in our own strength. It was clear that Moses focused on the rod, which represents the power of God. And Joseph was leading the people. And as long as the rod was raised, the power of God was the focal point. Joshua and his men are winning in the battle. But then, guess what? It comes to a place where Moses can't hold it up in his own strength anymore. You ever been there? Yeah. I've told y'all before how my dad was. My dad was a hardcore dude, man. He was like, I mean, I'm telling you, I don't know that he fighting don't mean anything. I don't know that he was the greatest fighter. He's just so tough. I've had guys tell me before. It's like, man, dude, your dad was tough. And he was, you know what I'm saying? I mean, nothing was ever good enough for him. I remember he used to tell me, boy, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, man. Wipe that dirt off and wipe them tears off your face, boy. Get, back, get up and get going, you know? But I fought, and so all my life, that's kind of how I was living. And I'm kind of thankful for that. I'm not going to lie to you. There's a part to me that I'm glad that whenever I, I can I just say this on TV? Uh, I mean, on, on the real. I, I'm kind of glad that when I have a little diary, I still get up and go to work. Is that all right if I tell you that? Yeah. I wash my hands good, don't worry. <laughs> I'm kind of glad when I got a belly ache or I got a little bit of a headache that, you know what? I get up and I go to work. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't know that everybody's going to do that, and that's on you, man. You know, I heard a story one time. My daddy had a broken arm carrying a sledgehammer, walking up a hammer, and that wasn't even his job. When I hear stuff like that, I'm like, dude, a little bit of diarrhea, a little bit of a snotty nose. I need to get up and I need to go to work. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, another story. 
point that I'm trying to make is, is this, is that he was growing tired in the battle. Sometimes we grow weary. I get that. But guess what? God wants to give us strength as we're going through and we're getting weary if we'll look to him. And Moses couldn't maintain it anymore. He, and that's what I was trying to get at. My dad used to say, pull yourself up by the bootstraps and get it done, boy. But guess what? One of the great, I really gained power and victory for whenever I submitted and fell to my knees. That's what I was trying to pray with your brother earlier. There's a power source from God that you didn't even know existed that you can tap into when you allow your strength to, to humble itself under the power of God. Now things turn into a whole, I'm talking about Look, dude, you want to talk about something funny. You know, I, I don't know how to be a surgeon, but I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night. Listen, I don't know how to walk in victory, but when I bowed my knee to Jesus, dude, all of a sudden the power of God showed up. And the thing that I couldn't get victory over, it started falling off in my life. Moses couldn't hold up his strength in his hands anymore. I'm like, Daddy, I can't whoop this one. I ain't tough enough to beat up Slewfoot. That's a nickname for the devil. I can't beat him up, Dad. I'm not even tired. tired I'm tired of getting whooped by him. I'm not pretty tough, but I'm tired of getting whooped by him. I'm getting weary. I don't. I don't want to keep on getting beat up. I got to do something, and it ain't the way you taught me, Dad. Mm -hmm. I can't stand on my own. I can't pull myself up by the bush. I got to bow my knee. Hallelujah. I got to bow my knee to the king. I got to surrender. I got to sit down. I need to sit down on this rock because I got to take a rest. I got to fight from a resting position. You know, many have emphasized the help of her and Aaron regarding Moses. You know how they raised his hands and we need brothers and sisters in the Lord to help us. And all that's true. We need brothers and sisters in the Lord to help us. But listen, that shouldn't be the emphasis of what we look at. The church will turn everything into a doctrine before you know it. <clears throat> you got men's groups and women's groups. Oh, and don't get me wrong. I'm not picking on what she was saying. I think it's good if women can come together and share their concerns. But listen to me. Freedom is not in you opening your mouth and confessing to your sister in the Lord. Freedom is in you getting to the Lord and Hallelujah. saying, Lord, I need you to take this thing right. from me. Amen. I need you to work in me. Lord, I need the victory and the power of you to work in my heart. Amen. amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yes. We need that in our lives. Amen. amen. We, we need, but we need brothers and sisters that will remind us that we can't win it in our own strength. That's right. That's right. Ultimately, we should be aware that it wasn't her or Aaron that won the battle. It wasn't Moses that won the battle. It was the Lord that won the battle. And the biggest part that her and Aaron played, in my opinion... In this victory, it has to help Moses hold up his hands. But you know what they did? They, they helped him take a seat on a rock. Oh, hallelujah. They put, they put that rock up under his hiney and said, Moses, you need to take a seat hallelujah. on the rock. You. you need to learn how to rest in Christ. That brings me to point number one. I only got five minutes to preach four points, but we're going to do it. You just hang with me. It's going to happen. Valley, point number one, the valley of darkness. The word Amalek means a valley dweller. He was the enemy of Israel. Let me tell you something. Your enemy lives in a valley called the valley of darkness. He thrives in darkness. He thrives in the low places and he wants to get you to come fight him where he lives. He, he wants you to come to his neighborhood. He does not want you to... To be able to fight from the position of where God has given you the victory. Because he can't defeat Jesus. Amen. He's already been defeated by Jesus. Hallelujah. Amalek is a valley dweller. We need to understand who we're fighting. See, he wants you to come to this place and fight. I don't know that we have time to go through all the scriptures, but I want to kind of give you a little bit of a thought. See, in darkness we fail when we fight. I want you to know that the enemy, Amalek, Satan, the, the one that you and I are fighting, he has a plan to bring the whole world under his submission. It's a very organized, methodical plan. I don't want to get all into all that world domination stuff right now, but I'm here to tell you that it's a reality. From the beginning of when he attempted to exalt himself above the throne of God, he has not stopped. He continues to try to take over this world. It's happening as we speak. I guarantee you, listen to me, all this chatter on the TV, oh, it's the Dems, oh, it was Trump, oh, it's the Dems, oh, it was Trump. All this going back and forth like a ping pong game, you know what that is? That's just distraction. Yeah, somebody did it. There's probably some 
garbage on both sides, to be truthful. The fact of the matter is, though, there's a whole lot bigger stuff going on behind the scenes, and they're just trying to distract us to get our eyes off of what's really happening. As the enemy, in an organized effort, attempts to bring this world back under a one world order. I'm telling you, he tried to do it at Babel. God confused the languages. And from that time frame, moving forward, he has continued to do it again. And he will continue until Amalek is utterly destroyed. There's a scripture in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. And it talks about the fact, I'm not going to re read it to you, <laughs> but it talks about the fact that one day the son of perdition, it's talking about the Antichrist, will be revealed. But that there's going to be a falling away first. Some people have interpreted that word falling away in the Greek, it's apostasia, as that is de 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 describing the rapture. I don't believe that. I believe the word apostasia describes what it sounds like, apostasia, turning away from the truth. I believe that there's a time frame that the Bible warns about where the people of God will no longer desire to hold on to the truth, but that they've been seduced by demon spirits and that they will buy into a lie of false doctrine and that there will be a great fall falling away that's taking a place in the midst of the church and ultimately a great falling away at that moment in time when he really wants to elevate himself. See, just as Jesus will be unveiled in the book of Revelation, so will the Antichrist. He will also be unveiled. That's what it says. This son of perdition, there's coming a day when he will be revealed. But even now we see a falling away from good sound doctrine. We see a falling away from the truth. Look what it says in these scriptures here. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 3 through 4. We're talking about the valley of darkness. We're talking about fighting. We don't want to fight from the place where our enemy wants us to fight from. He wants to keep us in darkness so that we're unaware of the truth and we're unaware of the light. Look what it says. For the time will come when they, talking about people that listen to the Bible, that care about the Bible, they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, you know that there's people that want to have what they think is Jesus and what they want to do at the same time. Come on, time. preach it. There's people that want to say, but I want to believe that it's okay that, that Sarah and Tammy get married and live together. I want to believe that it's okay that I cohabitate with my a significant other and have sex outside of marriage. I want to believe that it's okay that I get high if I want to get high. I want to believe that it's okay that I do what it is that I want to do. They won't endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they will heap to themselves. They'll make piles of preachers because they have itchy ears. If you look up the word itchy, you know what it means? Pleasant words. They want a preacher that's going to speak pleasant words to them. Now, if you get confused and you think that this preacher got it all figured out and he ain't got his own things in his own life that he needs the Lord to deal with, then you are really confused and you should not think that way. But listen to me. This preacher don't want, don't want to have itchy ears. This preacher doesn't want to just hear words that are pleasurable. This preacher wants to hear the truth of God's word that will correct him when he needs correction, that will set him straight. That will put him on the straight and narrow. That will keep him heading in the right direction. Hallelujah. I don't want to have a bunch of little piles of preachers. Oh, I feel like getting a little bit of this today. I won't get a little bit of this today. But the church is filled with it. Churches are filled with it. Preachers that just want to get. Listen, I said it, I said it on Wednesday. There was a preacher that I know very well. And he's in this community. And I love the dude. I'm just going to tell you what happened. I'm not going to tell you his name because it's not important. He's like, look, man. I got a couple of gay couples coming to the church now. What are we going to do, man? This is changing everything. I'm like, what are you talking about what we're going to do, bro? We're going to do what we're supposed to do the whole time. We're going to keep preaching the truth. Yeah. Well, what are you talking about? You're going to change the message because now you got gay people sitting in your congregation? No. If they really want to hear the truth, then they will respond to the truth. Amen? Yeah. Don't come in here. Oh, man, the preacher says something today. He poked me in the eye. He stepped on my toe. I'm not coming back. That's a lie from the devil. The word of God by itself is enough to cause an offense. It can be a stumbling block. But listen to me. Don't let the word of God offend you. Let the word of God heal you. Amen? That's what the word of God is here to do. To heal you. Just thank a preacher that will tell you the truth. Amen? Amen. Yeah. They have itchy ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they will be turned to fables. 1 Timothy 4, 1 says this. Now the Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, the Spirit speaks expressly. The Holy Spirit has a, the Holy Spirit has a specific message for you and I tonight about the end days. 
And this is what it says. Some shall depart from the faith. They will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. I don't know what you want to do about this. Some people believe in once saved, always saved. But the word depart means to remove self from. Hmm. You were there. Now you're gone. You believe the seducing spirit from the devil and you turned your back on the Lord. In the end days, we are told that there will be great deception, a move of Satan that will cause people to be blinded by false doctrines that are given power to deceive by demon <laughs> spirits. Sadly, the Bible also teaches that the reason this occurred is because it's really what people wanted. You hear what I said? People really, really wanted to be deceived. What I mean is they wanted it to be okay. Oh, marijuana is legal now, dude. I can order me some THC oil and put it in my little vape pipe and I can hit it whenever I want. Now the government made it legal. But listen to me. What did it do to your mind, man? Did it, did it get you closer to God or did it move you away from God? Uh, it, what, what, this, you think there's a spirit behind it? I know that THC. And listen, I... Lord help me. I smoke more THC than most people ever seen in their life. But guess what? One thing that I know about what THC did, it might not, my physical body might not have been addicted to it, but there was a time in my life when I was seeking to smoke tea, uh, marijuana harder than sometimes I run after the Lord. Oh, I gotta get me some weed. I gotta get me some weed. I know it's weird to preach that way, but that's, that's a, you know what that is? That's what you call a spiritual addiction. There's demon spirits connected to that. Just like there's demon spirits. Listen, I watched my cousin. He still owns, holds records at Central High in Baton Rouge and at Southeastern. They got a little small program. They ran a wishbone offense. He was a quarterback. He got caught up in gambling. Lost everything. I'm talking about he built a business from the ground up, selling siding. It was all over TV and Lafayette. Built Made made millions, lost it. Made made hundreds and hundreds of thousands again, lost it. Listen, whenever that kind of thing happens, there are demon spirits connected to that. That's why you can't just stop. That's why you can't just say no, but I'm here to tell you, good news, good news. When you sit down on the rock, hallelujah, the Holy Spirit will break the power of that thing. Break the power of that thing in your life. Give you victory in that area. Oh, thank you, Lord. But sometimes people want to live in their darkness. They don't want to hear all of that. Right. It says in Romans 1 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts and dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Ultimately, what this scripture is talking about is that mankind rejected the truth. I know that's not you in here this morning. You're accepting the truth. That's why you're here. And it doesn't mean that sometimes when you still fail as a Christian that you've rejected God altogether. We know better than that. Each and every one of us as Christians have failed and we will continue to fail. But God's people are getting up people. Even though you fall down, you get back up. A righteous man falls seven times and he gets back up. Yes, Hallelujah. And then one day the Lord's going to give you the victory in that area. Right. As you learn to sit on the rock. Yes. It says, though, in here, Romans 124, the Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. But unrighteous men suppress the truth. Oh, da 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 I don't want to hear what that preacher just said. Everything was good up until that point. La, 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 la. I don't want to hear that. No, you suppress the truth. Guess what you do? At some point in time, he'll turn you over to yourself. I don't know about you, but I've been in some dark places, folks. I'm not, not as dark as some people, but I've been in some dark places. Been in some places I don't want to go back to. Oh, Lord, please don't turn me over to myself. Please, Lord, don't turn me over to myself. I don't want to go back where I've been. I'm not trying to just get all emotional. Honey. I'm trying to tell you the truth. I don't want to go back Amen. to where I've been. Amen. I was a mess. I was being destroyed. Mm -hmm. God will give you wings like an eagle. Yeah. He'll lift you up. Yeah. He'll bring you somewhere where you never thought you could go. Glory. Lord, don't turn me over to myself. Yes. It says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 8 through 12, as part of that scripture that we already talked about. Where the Antichrist is going to be revealed. Ultimately there's going to be a day when he's going to be on this earth. And he's going to be performing miracles. And people are going to be so deceived. He's going to cause fire to fall from the sky. He's going to cause all kinds of stuff to happen. And people are going to be like, oh, worship him. Worship him. He's a false God that elevated himself. But the thing of it is, is this is what the scripture says this. Because he is, is going to say, and with all deceivable of, the, of unrighteousness in them that perish. Why? Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. 
And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. They wanted to believe a lie. So God allowed them to believe a lie. If that's what they want, God will allow. That's why when you try to talk to somebody and there's something that's in their life that's blatant sin. And they're just like completely blown out and they're looking at you like you're stupid and crazy. They believe it in the delusion. And right now, it doesn't mean that they never will come to the place, but you're throwing per pearls before swine and you try to convince them. The Holy Spirit has to convince them. God will allow people to believe a delusion at that. I don't even have time to go to the text in the Old Testament where God said, okay, who's going to help me out here? And a lying spirit showed up and said, I'll help you. What you going to do? I'll go and tell them that they're going to win when they're really going to lose. Good, go tell them because that's what he wants to hear anyway. He wants to hear he's going to win, but I'm trying to tell him that he's going to lose. But he doesn't want to hear what I'm going to say. And so he's going to move forward anyway. So go ahead, go ahead and encourage him in, in his lies. For this cause, God will give them strong delusion that they would believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Lord, help us. Help us that we wouldn't have pleasure in unrighteousness. Yes. You know, God can change your taste buds. You know that? I mean, he'll change the flavor of the way things taste to you. That's what I need. I don't know about you, I need, I need a surgical removal of my old taste buds and buds, and Lord, give me some new ones. I don't want to like the way that stuff that I used to like the way it tasted to taste it. I don't want it to be good anymore. Amen. I want I want some new taste buds, Lord. Ultimately, Satan will deceive millions and drag them to his eternal value valley. But don't be confused. He's deceiving millions today. People are walking in darkness and unrighteousness and they love it and they want to stay in it. And God will give them what they thought that they wanted. Right. You know, there's another scripture in, in John 3 where it talks about this is the condemnation of the world. Men loved darkness and they would not come to light. They wanted to hide their deeds and they didn't want to bring their deeds to the light where they could be manifest, where God could prove, hey, look at what they're doing. They're doing the work of light. Amen. That was point number one. Amalek means valley dweller. There's an enemy that wants to cloud our mind with deception. He wants us to cause us to walk in a darkened valley. But you know what the word of God says? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for your rod and your staff. They comfort me. You got the Lord on your side. Amen. Even when you're in the valley of darkness. Hallelujah. Darkness can't defeat you. The Lord is your victory. And that brings me to point number two. Bear with me. Go ahead. Get your, get your bathroom break if that's what you got to do because I'm preaching this message. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Point number two, let Joshua fight. Amen. Let Joshua fight. Verse 9, Moses said unto Joshua, choose us out men and go fight. Go fight with Amalek tomorrow. Joshua means Jehovah is salvation. Did you know that Joshua is the Hebrew variant of Jesus, which is the Greek word? Jesus' name was Joshua. A lot of these people get caught up in this Hebrew stuff and they're like, oh, his real name is Yeshua. And if you don't pray in the name of Yeshua, you're not going to get your victory. I ain't, I ain't like that, but I'm just trying to say there is truth. His name is Yeshua. Jesus is Joshua. Hallelujah. And so in some ways, Joshua is the Old Testament type of Jesus. In many other ways, we've seen how other people are types. The point that I'm trying to make is, is this, is that you got to let Joshua go before you in the battle. You got to let Joshua lead the battle. You got to let Joshua fight the battle. You got to let Jesus give you the victory. You can't just pull yourself up by the bootstraps. You need to let the Lord do it. Look at Romans chapter 5 verses 1 through 2. It says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into what? You know what access is? I'm about to break it down for you. But you know what access is? It's an open door that you're able to walk through. So by, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Hallelujah! Don't fall asleep on me. I know you're getting tired. I know that people's attention spans only supposedly 30 minutes, but we're breaking those traditions. Thank you, Lord. Yes. We have access to grace yes. where we can stand. Mm. We're in the last days and we need to be able to stand yes. in the face of adversity. Mm -hmm. 
The word, the words just, there's three main concepts I want to talk about real quick. Justified by faith. You know, and I'm not going to break it down too much, but I just want you to know that when you're justified by faith, it means you're righteous in the eyes of God and he says so. Let me repeat yes. that. Yes. You're righteous in the eyes of God and he says so. I was trying to talk to my nephew about this scripture one time. He's like, keep talking about the cross, keep talking about the cross. I'm like, let me give you an example. You read this scripture right here, Romans 5, 1 through 2. Go back to the top. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Next verse. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace where we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Did you see the word cross in there? No. You didn't see the word cross, did you? But can I tell you that this scripture is screaming the word cross? Amen. Can I tell you because the word justified means or you've been made righteous? Can I tell you that the way you were made righteous is that God the Father sent the righteous one? And the righteous one took his righteousness and put it on a cross. Yes. Why? So that he could pay a penalty and that an exchange could take place. Where he would take your sin upon him and give his righteousness to you. And when you said yes to that plan, guess what happened? God clothed you in the righteousness of Jesus. And he said, justified by faith. Righteous by faith. And now guess what? You have access by faith into this grace. You have access by faith into this grace. See, now you're clothed in the righteousness of God so the Holy Spirit can live in you. And what you need moving and operating in your life is the grace of God about of Joshua going before you in the middle of the battle and doing for you what you could not do for yourself. Amen. What is it that you struggle with? You need grace in that area of your life. A supernatural power from God that does something on the inside of you. It's grace that changes the taste buds. It's grace that defeats Amalek. It's grace that moves and operates in your life. It's grace that puts the knockout punch on the enemy. It's grace. It's grace. It's grace. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that moves in your life. That gives you the victory. It's grace that prevents you from going down the wrong path to begin with. Hallelujah. And the way, the reason you have entree into grace, the reason you have an open door is because you're being justified. The Holy Spirit moves with grace based upon what Jesus already did at the cross. Amen. Because of what Jesus did at the cross, you've been given the gift of righteousness. I'm going to keep saying it the same thing, but I'm going to say it different ways. <laughs> because Jesus went to the cross and gave you the gift of righteousness, now you have access to grace. Grace gives you victory. Amen. We need your grace, Lord. Yes, but you don't know how bad it is, preacher. Uh, no, I may not know how bad it is in your life, and I'm not making fun of it. But guess what? I don't care how bad it is. Grace will get you through. Amen. Because now it ain't you working it, man. It's the Holy Spirit doing the job. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Grace enters in wherein we stand. You know what that word means? It means established. Boy, that's a good word. Established Firm. I don't know about you, but I want to be established in the faith. Yes. Not a rock, standing on a rock. But before I'll ever stand on a rock, next week I think I'm going to, I'm going to preach a message called Sit, Walk, Stand. Before I'm ever going to learn how to stand on a rock, I better learn how to sit on a rock. Yes. Established in the faith. If you're going to stand, that's what I, that's what I was about to say, for, to lead me into point number three. If you're going to stand, you will have to learn to sit. Point number three, take a rest on the rock. Amen? Verse 12. But Moses' hands were heavy and they took a stone and they put it under him and he sat there on. So many times we're like Moses, but we can't keep the battle going. We mean well, we want to fight, but we can't keep our hands raised in our own strength. It wasn't until he sat on the rock that victory was fulfilled. You ever been in an exercise class before? Come on, some of you women, I know. I don't mind, I don't mind telling you, I've been in some of them little exercise classes. Like, where you're trying to hold, all you're trying to do is just hold your arms up in the air. That's it. After you've done a few push-ups and a few different things, and you're just trying to hold your arm, and your arms are like burning, dude. Like, my shoulders are on fire! I can't keep them up anymore! My hands are lowering, like I'm just trying to fight it. If you've ever been there, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> shoulders are hurting, man. Moses couldn't lift his hands up anymore. And what they did was they put a rock underneath him to give him some rest. And then they kind of helped him on the side. Man, that's, that's what we need, dude. Yes. We need the grace of the Lord to give us the strength that we need in order to stay in the battle and just let God do what he got to do. That's it. That's 
I wish I could preach to you about hupomone, which means remain under the trial in a God-honoring way. Stay under it. Allow God to do what he has to do. Listen, Matthew 11, 28 through 30. We're talking about rest, resting on a rock. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. You feel heavy? You feel like you've been working real hard? He says, this is what I'll do. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Boy, I'm telling you, I could preach on that for another 20 minutes because you know what? The Lord wanted to speak something earlier to somebody here that you're going through the middle of something. Somebody may have wronged you. You've been trying to handle it in your own strength and you refuse to let go of it. Jesus said, I am meek and lowly. But Lord, I don't know how to let go of it. I feel so frustrated. He said, I am meek and lowly. If you will learn how to let me fight the battle for you, you will find rest for your weary soul. Let go and let God. Let me get into the battle and let me do what I do. Amen. Amen. The rest is in the victory of Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> Jesus Christ in him crucified is the rock. Listen to me. I'm saying it right now. I'm preaching to you the gospel. Jesus Christ and him crucified is the rock that we rest on. And to be honest with you, I don't even have to work hard to make this point. Hallelujah. I don't have to even go to the New Testament to make this point. I can go right back a little bit, a couple verses above where we were. Look at Exodus 17, 5 through 6. I'm trying to tell you that Jesus is the rock. Bear with me. I know. I have. I've preached way too long today. And we're, gonna, we're, we're getting close. Y'all been faithful. I, I, hey, look, I've been enjoying this message. I don't know if y'all are right. <laughs> Exodus 17, 5 through 6. This is a little bit above what we read. All right? A little bit above what we read. I'm trying to make the point that Jesus Christ and him crucified, the object of our faith, is the rock. Yeah. And I'm trying to tell you that the text tells us that. And the Lord said unto Moses, the Lord said, Go on before the people, take with you the elders of Israel and your rod, wherewith you smoke the river. Take in your hand, go behold, I, the Lord, will stand before you there upon the rock in Horeb, and you shall smite the rock. And there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And the apostle Paul said in the New Testament. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Listen. He hit that rock with a stick. He smote the, the Lord on the rock with a stick. Jesus was smoked when he was hung on the cross. Jesus died on that cross and spiritual living water came flowing out of him. He said, you're going to get thirsty again, Samaritan woman, if you drink the water out of this well. But any man that will drink the waters that I give, they will be like living waters that will spring out of him. And he will never, ever, 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 ever Jesus. thirst again. Hallelujah. Jesus is the rock. Listen to me. Jesus Christ and him crucified. It might sound foolish to somebody, but look what it says in 1 Corinthians 1.18. I'm almost to the end. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The message of the cross is the power of God. Yes. Yes. All right, this is point number four. This is the last point. Y'all ready? Yes. Point number four, keep your eyes on the banner. Amen. Keep your eyes on the banner. It says in verse 15 of the text we were reading, Moses built an altar and called the name of it, y'all remember? Jehovah Nisi. Jehovah Nisi, which means God is my banner. You know what a banner is? I mean, I'm not trying to get all sports related on you, but banners, they hang them up and they got some banners in the Superdome, not a whole lot of them, but one of them banners says world champions. LSU's got a couple banners probably that say national champions. Banners remind you of a victory. Banners are, banners, they show forth the victory. And guess what? The banner of the Lord, it not only shows a past victory, but it gives hope for a future. Oh, yes. When you keep your eyes on the banner, I can remember one time I was in a 5K and it had, all of a sudden I got close and I'm like, man, what is that? Man, that's a flag flapping in the air. It was a banner. Look, this is the end point. You're about to be done. It's a rally cry. It's a place that you to keep your eyes focused, to look upon, to understand that this is where the victory is. Jesus is the victory. Amen. That's what Moses called that place. He called it 
the place of victory. It was, the, it was the banner to keep your eyes on. God said in the text that we read that he would fight Amalek until the end, that there would be a day when the struggles of the dark valleys are gone. There will be a day when Satan will come to his end, when he is cast into the lake of fire. Listen to me, Revelation 20, verse 10. You can put it up there. I'm closing. Two more verses. You ready? We're about to close and we're just going to pray. We're going to ask God to give us revelation of the message. We're going to ask God to move in our hearts. Amen. And to give us strength. Praise God. I'm not going to keep you, but another four minutes. I know I went over, but you bear with me. Revelation 20 verse 10. The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be term tormented day and night forever and ever. I'm telling you, there's coming a day when Amalek will be utterly destroyed. God is going to get rid of him and he will be no more. And until that day is here and the war is finally over, we have a banner to look to. It's a banner of victory. The banner is the victory of Jesus that he won for us at Calvary. Look at Galatians 6, 14. Truthfully closing with this scripture. God forbid that I should glory save in. That's another way to say except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why is he glorying in the cross? Because by this, the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. See, the world and the spirit behind it are telling us it's okay to go in a certain direction. But the spirit of God through his word is telling us. That's not my direction. And because of the cross, I've been crucified to the lies of the world. Amen. And the world has been crucified to me. And I ain't trying to pick on nobody, but I'm just trying to say, that's why I don't like Cardi B. And, and the only reason I'm bringing her up is because I guess Donnie was with you at the bowling alley and you told him something. They must have been playing her because he'd sent me a text and said, Rob's over here, got me listening to Cardi B. That's why I don't like her. She's part of the world system. I, if you listen to it, that's on you. That's why I hate Mardi Gras. Oh, I'm about to go off now. Another 15 minutes. Oh, no, I'm about to say, I hate Mardi Gras. Amen. And I'm not ashamed to look in my eyeballs and tell you. Amen. And if you went to the parade, that's on you. And that's between you and Jesus. But if you never knew it was wrong, guess what? You came to the right church today. If you didn't like what I said, you could go down the road a couple of blocks and there'll be a preacher over there and he'll give you some pleasant words. And he'll talk to you and he'll tell you, oh, it's perfectly fine. But listen, there was a girl yesterday when I was working. She said, why are you, why you, gotta, why are you in a bad mood? I said, because I hate Mardi Gras. Amen. She said, why do you hate Mardi Gras? Just people having fun. I said, no, 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 no. Let me, let me, let me tell you what Mardi Gras is. I'm going to tell you, you wanted to know what Mardi Gras was, I'm about to tell you what Mardi Gras is. And I said, don't you get all loud on me either, girls, because you know we ain't got no insulation. All my patients go here. You let me talk to them one-on-one -on -one if they want to know my opinion about Mardi Gras. But you want to know, so I'm about to tell you about Mardi Gras. All right, here we go. Thank you, Jesus. I'm about to find it. I got to find it. Come on, bear with me. Bear with me now. Just give me a second. Uh -huh, here we go. Look at it. Put it up. Galatians chapter 5, verse 20. These are called the lusts of the flesh. Amen. Your flesh wants you to do some stuff that God don't want you to do. Me saying something is wrong isn't going to change your mindset. But me instituting the truth in your life will allow the Holy Spirit to have his way. And at some point in time when the Holy Spirit convinces you that what I told you is right, you won't want it anymore. Until that day, don't let me judge you. Don't let nobody else judge you. Look, even if you work for Robert and you might have went to the parade, don't let Robert judge you on Monday when he gives you a hard time. Come on, somebody, help me out. The Holy Spirit's going to do the work. But we're here to tell you the truth. Right? Here we go. These are the lusts of the flesh. Idolatry, witchcraft. You know what the word witchcraft really is in Greek? Pharmakia. You know what it's talking about? Taking drugs. Taking drugs that alter your senses. And you know what it does? It allows demon spirits to have a little easier access to jack up your life. I'm just telling you. Hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. I don't need to explain all that. Envying. Did you ever envied somebody? Murders, drunkenness. Look at this. Revelings. 
Ramblings. Uh-oh. Well, what does that mean? It just means I'm getting a little bit rowdy. Hold on a second. Click on that because I got a little Bible app that talks about the Greek word. And that's what I did. I, I told the little nurse. I said, look, let's click on that word and see what happens. Here we go. I wish I could show it to you, but I'm going to read it to you. You believe me when I read it to you? Oh, you believe me? I'd be like, that preacher's lying. I love a parade and I ain't going to give it up. No. Come on. That preacher ain't lying to you. Look what it says. A revel, a carousal. A nocturnal and riotous procession of half-drunken and frolicsome fellows who after supper parade through the streets with, oh, I ain't even got there yet. Hold on. It's about to go down, bro. With torches and music. Why are they doing this? In honor of Bacchus and some other deity. That's Mardi Gras reinvented. All about the worship of a lot. Oh, the preacher ain't going out there to worship Bacchus. I get that. And when you go trick-or-treat, you ain't worshiping Satan either. But listen to me. The enemy just keeps on reinventing acts of darkness. And what the Lord is trying to say is, I want you out. I want you out of the world. And I want you in Christ. And I want to change you. And I want you to be a light in the midst of darkness. And I want you to be a witness. 